Well, good morning and welcome. I may be off screen, but I'm here. My name is Bernie Jarosaw. I'm the marketing manager for Whitmix, and I'm going to be facilitating today's live Q&A webinar. Well, this is the first for us. We, we invite you to ask any questions you'd like in the realm of, of product use, product maintenance, or problems you might be having. Uh, we also welcome any technique or technology questions, uh, and those will be answered uh, after you type them into the to the questions box in the upper right hand corner of your screen. So just type them in and, and I'll be able to see them and, and we'll ask our uh, panelists. So today we have two of our technical support people, uh, probably both of whom are recognizable to many of you. Uh, we have Craig Pickett and Brandon Smith. Uh, between them, they should be able to cover just about any question you have from from uh, older core products uh, up until up to and through the the new digital products, mailing, printing, etc. Uh, also, if you are CDT, the webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit toward your recertification. Uh, you'll receive an email within uh, one to two days, and uh, and then we'll tell you how to obtain the credit. It'll be a short test, uh, so listen carefully. Uh, in addition, sorry about that, the, the uh, webinar is being recorded. So within uh, 48 hours, it'll be up on the Whitmix website in our webinar section. So if you're a CDT, uh, just uh, give it a day or two and we'll be in touch with you. Uh, and also, of course, you can check out the webinar anytime you need it between the end and uh, going forward. So we're going to start with some questions that some of you sent ahead of time. So while we're answering those, Go ahead and feel free to, to type in the questions that you might already have. Uh, please check that out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the very first question that was submitted was, I have a really old whip mixer. Can I still get parts and have it repaired? And I think maybe Craig, that would be a good question for you. Can he, can he still or she gets, uh, get parts and have it repaired? Yeah, we, we love that you still refer to it as a whip mixer, uh, which, which is really interesting simply because it was never called or named a whip mixer. That was just sort of a, uh, a nickname that people gave them. Um, it depends upon the age of the machine and it depends upon the part. Now, I know that that's a rather, you know, kind of vague answer for you, but uh, we need to have you call us. And the reason that we say that is because the motors on the machines uh, changed over the years and some of them have smaller uh, motor drive shafts and so some of the current product uh, won't exactly fit those drive shafts um, things like the collets and things like uh, some of the gearing that is there um, also there was a change in the nylon gear uh, in the bottom member of the machine uh, from straight teeth to slanted teeth. And if you have straight teeth, we can't replace that. Uh, most of the parts of the pump, which are at the top of the machine, are replaceable. They're still basically the same uh, as they were. The rotor, which is the part that holds what are called the veins at the top of the machine and the pump, changed uh, several years ago. Initially, the rotor had a key and keyway system that held it in place. Uh, and that uh, was vacated for an option for gluing that rotor onto the drive shaft. So there are some changes that have taken place over the years, and um, what we need you to do is just give us a call, uh, let us know what the serial number uh, is on that machine. Now, when I say that, on the side of the machine, there's a large sticker, and that's a lot of motor information, but it's not the serial number of the machine. We need you to look for a small uh, blue and white sticker that would say Whitmix serial number on it. Uh, and then we'll be able to help you out. In most cases, what you need to know is that if the motor is still operational, the rest of the machine, uh, we can get up and running. All right. Thanks, Greg. I think this next question is also for you. Um, I'm thinking of buying a Pro 100 porcelain furnace from another lab. 
Is there anything I should be aware of before I get the machine? The first thing you should be aware of is that the machine went out of production over 10 years ago. Uh, and so parts are either non-existent for it now or are very few in existence. Um, also, you should be aware that that machine has 20-year-old technology in it, which means that um, just like all the old computers that are out there, it has a battery backup system. Um, if the battery has died in the machine and then subsequently it has lost power, either through a power failure or maybe somebody unplugged it and put it in storage, then when you go to plug it back in again, you will have lost the operating uh, system uh, on the machine and the board can't be reflashed again, at least not here at Webmix. So um, I would check a few things first. So first of all, is the machine currently operating? Uh, everything's up and running. If it is great um, and you're interested in it, please tell them not to unplug it until the battery's re been replaced. If they don't know how to do that, then give us a call at uh, Whitmix Support and we'd be happy to send them the instructions on how to replace the batteries. Just a, a small, one of those quarter size batteries that you can get at the grocery store. Um, and have that done and make sure everything is operational. Now, the other thing you need to know is the amount of hours that are on the thermal couple and the muffle of the machine that can be found in some of the uh, informational aspects if you go to special menu and special functions. Um, so you want to know that you're not buying a machine that's at the end of life on its muffle because if that's the case, you're going to be buying a new muffle. Um, muffles are available. There were two there's a separation there of the old style and the new style Pro 100s. So we have a, uh, a serial number where they began. If you'll give us a buzz, we can let you know what that is. For the new style, if it's new style, then that muffle and thermal couple are still available. They're the ones that we crossed over into the new Pro 200 uh, series porcelain furnaces. Now, with that said, you might just want to consider a Pro 200. Um, which has upgraded circuitry, it's all solid state, no more battery backup, has the uh, best of the uh, Pro 100 muffle and thermal couple, uh, plus a few other features that were added on later, so it's a good machine with the same kind of background as the Pro 100s, uh, which are time proven and tested. Uh, so that's probably it. If you have any other concerns about that before you pick one up, give us a buzz. Thanks. Uh, Brandon, what do I do when my print job failed? I guess that's kind of a general question, but that came in, so what should that I That is a pretty general question. Um, the first thing that I would do um, is send a ticket into the product support at Whitmix.com through email. Um, things that I would attach to that email would be photos of the prints on the build plate, um, pictures of maybe uh, if if the printer errored out, where it errored out, what the error message was, um, and then general information about what you were trying to print, what material you were trying to print with, um, and then maybe even screenshots of what the build looked like within the composer software um, so that we have a very, a very good amount of information before we get in touch with you and try and troubleshoot through things. Um, sometimes these general questions about, you know, okay, well, my, there's nothing on the build platform or there, you know, my print failed, what am I supposed to do? Um, it can be very vague in general. Um, so the more information that you can give us, the better we can answer that for you. We okay. get the same kinds of questions on our side and usually it began with it broke. Yeah. which doesn't tell us a lot other than it's broken. So yeah. the more, like Brandon was saying, the more specific you can be about everything surrounding the it broke, uh, the quicker, faster, easier it is for both of us on both sides to uh, take care of the problem. Hey, Brandon, uh, somebody wants to scan a model and then print it. So I think they're asking what the best way or easiest way to do that is. Can okay. you share that? Um, yeah. Generally, the, uh, the best way to do that um, without having to run through Model Builder or anything like that um, is you can actually set an order up in your three-shape dental system as a RPD. 
um, and then run it through the normal scan process. Um, the nice thing about the RPD module is um, it will, at the very end of the scan, close the bottom of the model. So then you can export that model as an STL and take it directly over to your print software and print it. Okay. Uh, Craig, the water on my model trimmer won't turn off anymore. So how, <laughs> do, how do they fix that? Uh, in general, what that means is that you've been using the little black handled valve on the right hand side of the machine to turn your water off and on. Um, this is just a regulator. It's not an on off valve. There are no rubber parts in there to seal anything. Uh, it's just a needle valve made out of brass. And the more that you've used it to turn it off, the more you've shoved that needle into the opening and opened it, opened it, opened it up wider until now it's at a point where it isn't closed at all anymore and the water just runs. Uh, originally there was a great big tag hanging on there uh, telling you that this was just a water control device, not an on-off device. But I know that there are a lot of folks, a lot of laboratories, a lot of uh, clinical offices that use that. Honestly, uh, what has to happen is you have to replace that. It's called the spray tube assembly. Uh, it's not hard to replace, it's not very expensive, but you'll need to replace it. And then, while you're in the process of doing that, put in some kind of an on-off water uh, valve prior to that so that uh, you can just turn your water on and you don't have to touch that little black knob anymore. That'll stop the, the uh, constant running leaking process. Now, if you're talking about a leak at the bottom of the machine, that's probably because sediment has built up in there and it's opened up the seal and you may need to replace that seal, clean the machine up. Uh, also another not very expensive job to do. Uh, the next question would be is, does Whitmix do that for you? Uh, if it's out of warranty, we'll certainly do it for you if it's within 20 years and we know some of those machines are older than 20 years uh, but it's a lot of expense for you to ship it back here to have it return shipped to you to pay our shop rate to have somebody clean it for you uh, when you can just kind of scrub it up yourself and get it redone uh, replace it with an inexpensive uh, part so if you need help with that once again just give us a call here at Whitmix at Technical Support. And Craig, there, somebody uh, sent in a question about a, a GP uh, vibrator. So they said when their original vibrator died, they bought a new one, mm. and it doesn't seem to vibrate as much as the older one did. So is there something wrong with the vibrator, or what should they know? No, honestly, there's nothing wrong with the vibrator. The new vibrators are different than the original gray uh, Whitmix vibrators, but they function differently also. Uh, the original Whitmix vibrator had inside of it, what we call a brass heart that, uh, that shook sideways back and forth. Um, and as they got older and about ready to die, uh, they got even more violent. And so it seemed like they had a lot of uh, vibration going on in them. Uh, if, if you were able at that point in time to compare it with a new one of that manufacturer, it wouldn't feel that, you wouldn't have that much vibration. It was part of the problem of the older ones dying. Um, unfortunately, those units were very expensive to manufacture and no one was purchasing them from us anymore because of that. And so we had to come up with a newer unit that was more in line with what the market allowed. Uh, this unit doesn't vibrate back and forth. It actually vibrates up and down. And so if you really want to test your unit, see how it's doing vibration wise, although it doesn't sound like it's loud, what you can do is just fill a beaker or a glass full of some water, just a little ways up, and put that water on top of your vibrator pad, turn it on, and watch what happens to the water as it begins to dance all over the place. Um, it really is vibrating quite well. And just as a reminder, you only need enough vibration to get your material moving. You don't want to over vibrate it. If you do that, that actually puts bubbles back in. Uh, it wouldn't seem like it, but it does. It puts bubbles back into the mix and uh, creates problems for you. Remember, you're not trying to move concrete. You're just trying to move gypsum product, and it just has to have enough vibration that it moves properly. So you're fine. Back to you, Brandon. Uh, I've been unsuccessful printing IBTs on supports. 
uh, what do I do to get them to print? So this is a question that we get a lot lately. Um, the problem with the IVT materials is that they're very flexible. They're very soft. They don't have a rigidness to them that allows them to be printed very successfully. Um, so we have come up with a technique to print the IVTs um, to where they'll print pretty successfully, pretty regularly. Um, so what you have to do um, is actually more in the design of the IBT than it is in the print software. Um, what we've discovered is, is that if you extrude up the uh, occlusal surface of the IBT and flatten it off with the planar cut tool, then print it directly on the build platform that it actually prints out pretty regularly and pretty successfully. Um, if you try to print it up on supports, you're going to have failures in certain areas because the support pins will flex um, so that they don't align to the surface of the IBT, and then you could have failures there. So as long as you print them directly on the build platform with a um, flat plane, um, and you really don't even have to use the flat plane tool, if you give yourself enough thickness off of the occlusion, you can actually pull that um, occlusal area down through the build platform and that will flatten it off for you. Um, so I know some some softwares don't allow for you to do a planar cut on those appliances so that's another way that you can do that uh, with our, our uh, print materials. Do you want to explain what IBT materials are? Um, so an IBT is an indirect bonding tray. It's an orthodontic appliance. Um, it basically allows you to uh, plan for bracket placement on a patient and then you create an IBT tray, which you can then take the brackets and place them in the tray, place it in the patient's mouth, and then you can cure them while they're in the tray. The tray puts them in the proper positions as they were planned in the software, and then you can um, then remove the tray and discard that, and then the brackets are in the right places. Okay, thanks. So somebody said they were getting an error uh, when trying to generate an STL output in three shape. Uh, what's causing this? It doesn't say what error that is, but. Um, that, that can be kind of general. Um, there's a few things that you can look at. Um, the first thing that I would check is to make sure that um, you didn't lose connection to the computer that has your STL output file on it. Um, a lot of times network issues can cause um, general output errors um, within the three shape software uh, because basically what the software does is it, it outputs a file into a folder um, if that folder is not seen on the network then you won't be able to output to it so you'll get an error in design um, another thing that can cause that issue is um, improperly set up manufacturing processes um, sometimes if you and this, this goes mainly for implants. If the implant uh, manufacturer is set up as the manu in the manufacturing process, sometimes the software will not allow you to generate the STL. Um, so what you have to do is go back into the manufacturing process, change it over to yourself, then run back through the design, and then a lot of times it'll let you out put that STL file. Okay. Back to you, Craig. Yeah. Um, what's the best way to increase and decrease the expansion with my investments? So ah. a little expansion, <laughs> expansion lesson. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's interesting because it, it's a common question, um, and you'd think we would all have it down pat, but the reality is that we get a particular formulation or a ratio down, and that's where we stay, and, and by the time we get around to trying to change it, we've forgotten what we're supposed to be doing. So. Um, so first thing is we need to talk about liquid powder ratio. That's the total amount of liquid to the amount of powder that you're using. That number of liquid needs to always stay the same. So you don't increase or decrease that. Um, it remains constant. So if it tells you you're going to use 26 ml uh, for a 100 gram package, then you're always going to use 26 ml total. Now, what you will do to increase your expansion is to add more of the liquid and reduce the water amount that you use. Now, if you're already 100% liquid for that 26, then you can't 
do any changes in that direction. And we'd prefer that you give us a call. Uh, we have some other tricks up our sleeve, but we'd rather not publish those out broadly uh, because what happens is that people get way off the course and we don't know where they are uh, and how to bring them back in again. So um, if, if you go up to 100% liquid to that powder ratio, so let's use the term 26 again, that'll get you your maximum amount of expansion. Now, if you were using uh, four water and the remainder liquid and you still have too much expansion, then you want to increase your water and decrease the amount of liquid that you're using. And that'll give you uh, a reduced expansion. Now, as long as we're talking about that, and I know this sounds like we're just trying to sell you a new mixing bowl. But the reality is that there's a physics problem with our mixing bowls. Sometimes we keep them way too long. And the longer we keep them, the more they have a tendency to um, reduce the amount of expansion that you have. It has to do with the relationship of the paddle edge and the wall of the mixing bowl. So if, if you're having that problem and you've gone to 100% liquid and you just can't get any more and you need it, and it's been a long time since you replaced your bowl, then uh, that would be our advice. It's just to order a new bowl. You don't have to have the whole assembly, not the lid and the mix paddle and all of that, just the bowl itself. Uh, you'll find you get a lot of expansion back rapidly. In fact, maybe too much. And you're going to have to change uh, and come back into a liquid water ratio uh, that works properly for you. Um, anyway, that's about it. That's, that's what it is. It's all about keeping the water or liquid powder ratio, the liquid, total liquid powder ratio, the same, and just changing the water to special liquid ratio, depending upon whether you want to go up or down. In expansion, up expansion is more special liquid, down expansion is more water. Okay, a customer sent me an intraoral scan. He wants me to send the scans uh, back in STL format. Every time I tried to do this using the export scan option, 3Shape won't let me. There must be a way to do this. Uh, there is a little bit of a workaround in the 3Shape software. Um, it has to do with the visualization output that you have the option of using. Um, 3Shape kind of wanted to block people from being able to output STL files directly from interoral scans. Um, so the one workaround that you do have um, is you can actually take and go into the design of the case. Um, you literally just have to open it and then close it right away. And then it will automatically output those visualization outputs as long as they're set up in your control panel. In order to set that up, um, if you go into the three shape control panel and you go into your system settings, um, you'll scroll down to the area where your um, order directory and your output directories are kept. Just below that, it'll actually an, have an option to enable um, visualization output automatically. So anytime you go into a case and close out of it, it's, it'll output visualization files. Um, those files will be in STL format and they will ha include any model files, um, any byte files, and they will also include any design files that you've done. Okay. Uh, here's an articulator question that came in. I have only, oh, I'm sorry, I have an older Whitmix articulator that needs repair. How do I get that done? Greg, I guess that would be you. Yeah. Um, Whitmix has been building articulators for a long, long, long time. And so, an older uh, articulator description is, is kind of like it broke. So we need to know which articulator that is. And often just by uh, the user looking at it without knowing or having an old uh, operations manual, they aren't gonna know. It just says Whitmix on there and it doesn't identify it. So the best way is just to take a few uh, photographs and email them in. Uh, to uh, one of the tech support reps. Uh, you can get that information just by giving us a call and we'll give you our email address. Um, and then we can identify that articulator for you and then we can talk about the parts. Now, if it's a current production model of Whitmix articulator, even though it's old, 
but it's still currently in production, then you can go to the website, which is whitmix.com, uh, click on products, and then drop down to um, occlusion. And if you click on occlusion, then that will open up the screen and you'll be able to find a photograph of your articulator. Uh, if you click on that, you can go over and on the right hand side, it'll drop you into, uh, you'll find it'll be a parts list. And you'll be able to look through that parts list and tell us if it's a broken part that you have or something. Now you're going to notice that some of those parts are not available for you just to order and have a send to you. Um, I had a couple of phone calls on an old uh, 8500 articulator, which is that original short Whitmix articulator that said small, medium, large on the frame. Um, and that one's been around since the 60s, and it's had some changes. Uh, and this particular doctor needed to replace a conjular element on that articulator. Wanted to know why he couldn't just order it. Sometimes we will tell you that we won't just send you those parts. You're going to have to send the articulator in because the part is connected to the calibration of the instrument. And we want to make sure that when that part is replaced, the instrument's recalibrated correctly. Um, we've had numerous phone calls over the years from very unhappy customers who replace a part and then previously articulated casts won't fit properly and it goes to the calibration of the of the uh, instrument so uh, we need you to send those back in so the easy answer is if it's part that's available on a current model that we can send you we're happy to do that if it's uh something that has to do with the calibration of the instrument it's going to need to come back in here uh, to allow us to repair it and recalibrate it um, and the best way for us to know what it is and identify it is for you to take some photographs of it and email those into us here at Technical Support. Okay, and I uh, just want to speak to the attendees in the uh, in the webinar. We're down to the last three questions, so uh, if you have questions, now would be the time to type them in, and we'll have Brandon and Craig answer those. All right. The next question is: Could you explain the difference between fixed? Uh, a fixed, semi, and fully adjustable articulator. <laughs> sure. Um, y y there's a lot of confusion, not about fixed. Everybody kind of gets that. Fixed articulator is one where you're not going to control the settings of the articulator. There are several that are out there. That means the condyles are fixed uh, in a specific position, and they're going to run in that position no matter what you do. You cannot change them. That degree of angulation is fixed. Uh, for example, uh, you might have a full frame articulator that's a fixed articulator. Um, if you drop down to, say, an Apex II, the old brass articulators everybody works on, that would be a good example of a fixed articulator. That angulation isn't changed uh, unless, of course, you take after it with it grinding stone and handpiece, but uh, it's going to be exactly the same. Uh, same with a larger frame articulator that has fixed settings. Now, a semi-adjustable uh, allows you to adjust certain settings, uh, generally uh, protrusive, angle can be adjusted, that's the up-down, and then also the side shift, which is in-out, that kind of tells you how the articulator is going to move laterally. Those are generally the uh, settings that can be changed on a semi-adjustable articulator. A uh, fully adjustable articulator gets confusing, but the, the key to a fully adjustable articulator is that the condyles themselves, the balls, can be moved. If it can't be moved, then regardless of the rest of the settings that you can change, it's not a fully adjustable articulator. So in the... Hanau, Danar, and Whitmix line, the only one that's fully adjustable is the Danar D5A. Uh, the little 8500 articulator, the original Whitmix, allowed you to move those condylar balls from small, medium, and large, but that's not fully adjustable. That's only three positions. The D5 allows you to move it anywhere along a scale of millimeters, and that's what you need to be fully adjustable. So fixed is, can't change the settings. Semi is, change a few, but you can't adjust the conjular balls. And fully is 
all settings, including the contour balls, uh, which determines, of course, the width here uh, between your condyles and between the TMJ. Uh, that can be adjusted. Very good. Um, the next question is uh, that, let's see, somebody somebody heard that we bought Gelaris, mm -hmm. and can they get cards for their porcelain furnace from us? Well, we, did, we didn't actually buy Gelaris. Um, what we did was we, we bought a portion of the Gelrus line of equipment from Air Techniques, who had originally purchased Gelrus years ago. Uh, Air Techniques is a manufacturer of great uh, office compression uh, systems, compressors for airline uh, distribution. Um, they came to us and asked us if we would like this Gelrus line and uh, the burnout furnaces we acquired, uh, but only starting at about the, the radiance, uh, Gelrus radiance, which was a uh, digital furnace. The analog uh, furnaces that were out there, we don't have parts for. The porcelain furnaces, the Gelrus porcelain furnaces, unfortunately, we already have a line of porcelain furnaces and didn't need another addition to that line. And so we opted not to acquire uh, the Gelrus porcelain furnace line and Air Techniques uh, closed that line down. And so my understanding at this point is that there are no more uh, parts available through Air Techniques. You may be able to find some parts, some muffles and things um, at other uh, non-OEM kinds of places, uh, repair shops and things of that nature. Uh, but Whitmix does not have parts for the ceramic furnaces. Um, we do for the burnout furnaces, and Whitmix also redesigned some of the electronics on the uh, on the Infinity and the PDQ uh, line of furnaces. It, it's an improvement electronically in uh, how it regulates the voltage coming to the machine. Um, the original size of the box and the medium and the large is the same. Those burnout plates uh, that were easily exchangeable they are also the same. The thermal couple is the same. So there are a lot of things about it uh, that's the same. It has a huge history. Uh, I just, in fact, wrote a blog. I think it'll be published at some time this year on it. Um, those Gelrus porcelain furnace, or not porcelain furnaces, I'm sorry, the burnout line. Uh, if you don't know that history, Gelrus was manufacturing that machine for Jelenko many years ago. Uh, Jelenko decided to go to Japan for its manufacture of equipment. Gelrus came out. Uh, so what you saw was a switch from the old black and orange burnout furnace into now the black and blue burnout Gelrus furnace. Same furnace, uh, different paint scheme. And what you have now is the Whitmix Gelrus version, which is basically the same furnace with a little update on the electronics to make that uh, come into line um, with uh, regulatory standards that we need to have. And uh, you got a great burnout for us that's been the same that you're uh, familiar with. So um, once again, no parts uh, through Whitmix for any of the Gelrus uh, porcelain furnaces, but we do have from the radiance forward uh, parts uh, for the burnout line. I love this next question. Uh, settle an argument for me, please. Water to powder or powder to water? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good question. Because if you go back and read in the books, um, like uh, the old science of dental materials, uh, no matter what color the cover is that you have on it, some of you it's blue, some of you it's red, just kind of depends upon the age that, that was done. It'll tell you to add the powder to the water. And that's true still, as long as you are hand mixing and hand incorporating. And that's what they were talking about at that point in time. So you want to measure water, put it in the bowl, and then add the, the powder to it. You don't want to put the powder in the bowl and then stick it under the sink, under the faucet. Okay, we don't want you doing that anyway because you're not measuring and your ratios are all off. Um, now, the caveat on that is that if what you are doing is vacuum mixing, then it doesn't matter. And you can add 
the pattern to the water or the water to the pattern. In fact, uh, the newer machines, a lot of the newer machines will actually add the liquid to the powder. So, um, you, you know, it, it does, if you're vacuum mixing and that's what you're doing, don't worry about it. If you're hand mixing, yes, you should be adding powder to water to make that work well for you. Hope that, uh, hope that answers. That seems to be one of the eternal questions along with ratios um, that we run into. You just get a more dense mix. Uh, by adding powder to water, you get the, the powder to infiltrate the water better and it wets everything better. And remember, we're not just talking like um, pancake batter here. We're, we're not just making everything wet. We're trying to incorporate chemistry that's in there and give it a chance to go through its chemical changes. So um, stay on line with that. If you need more information, by the way, on the chemistry of that and how gypsums work, um, you can go online at Wimix and take a look at the webinars. There's a couple of three of them in there on the gypsums and uh, how to choose one and the science behind it. Uh, it's always a good starting point. Again, if you're still, uh, if you're not, you know, if you haven't gone to the dark side with Brandon and you're making all your models by printing and you're still doing uh, the mixing stuff, uh, that's a good one to know, just so you understand all the chemistry behind it. Brandon, if somebody uh, wrote in that they wanted to know the email address and phone extensions for the, the technical support for, for the uh, digital products. So okay. Maybe you could. Um, the 800 number for the um, DTS area is 800-626-5651, um, and our extension is 1437. Um, also, you can send in email tickets to us as well, and that email address is productsupport at witmix.com. Perfect. Um, Craig, someone wants to know where they can see the blogs that you mentioned that you wrote. Oh, uh, if you go to the homepage at Whitmix, so Whitmix.com, pop up on your screen, uh, slide up, I believe it's on the right-hand side, but it's on, on a bar there, uh, along with webinars. You'll also see blogs. You can sign up for those. You'll automatically get them sent to you. Uh, or you can kind of scroll through and see what, uh, what's been written before. Uh, there's quite a few blogs up there. We endeavor to get at least one a week up there generally, and and that may extend to one every couple of weeks, but uh, there's a lot of them up there, a lot of different information. You're, you're perfectly welcome to clock in there and see them or sign up so that they're automatically sent to you. I'm down to our last question. So I'm uh, asking those of you who are in attendance, if there's anything you always wanted to ask what mix, but we're afraid to ask or just didn't, uh, now's the time. This is a good anonymous way of, of, uh, of learning. Uh, the last question is, uh, what's the best way to keep my stone from building up in my model trimmer? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, actually. Um, it, it needs to be cleaned regularly because what you're producing as you sit there and grind on that material is actually, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of a sticky uh, kind of material. It's like uh, uh, folks in Missouri uh, refer to it as Missouri mud. Uh, it's the stuff that gets stuck on the inside of your tire and puts everything out of balance. The folks in Louisiana refer to it as the Delta, uh, <laughs> the Delta clogging <laughs> device down there, uh, silt that silts out. That's what it's doing. Uh, and so it needs to be cleaned regularly. Now you can't use gyp strip products because they attack aluminum. Um, but just, uh, if you use just a nice, uh, detergent soap, something like, um, Simple green, uh, Dawn dishwashing liquid, something like that. You can, on the half horse machine, you can open up down on the, if you're facing the machine on the left hand side, there's a plug there. Pull that apart, uh, pull it out, and you'll be able to scoop out a lot of the stuff that's in there uh, and get rid of that. You don't want it to build up on the back side of what's called the mounting plate. That's where your uh, carborundum disc or your diamond disc is attached to. The back side of that can build up a lot of that material and throw it all out of whack. So if you've got a model trimmer that's dancing around on your tabletop, it's possible that you've got a buildup back there. You need some kind of long 
a spatula or a metal ruler or something that you can reach back inside there and then rotate the disc by hand just to knock that off. Um, but there's an easy old dental trick uh, from the lab guys that you can use too, um, which is simply this. Uh, you've got to let, first of all, you got to let the water run. So if, if you have uh, some kind of an auto on, auto off, you don't want to do that. You want to let the water run on the machine first so that the wheel's wet before you start cutting. And then after you've stopped cutting, let the water run for just a little bit so it'll flush that down. Uh, the other trick that you can do is to reach over and grab the exit tube uh, from where it's going out in your sink, lift it up a little bit higher than the machine so that the water starts to back up inside of the machine. Um, you'll know when it's backed up far enough because the water will start sloshing out the front of the machine at you. And as soon as that happens, dump the tube back down and you'll see a lot of that material just get flushed right out of there uh, and it'll help keep your machine clean. Um, now if you have the three quarter horsepower machine which is kind of shaped, it's not round on the front, it's shaped a little bit more like a house, um, that's a little easier to clean because it doesn't have uh, the well system in the bottom of it. Uh, and so you can open that up and just use a rag or a brush uh, and scrub that out down in there. Uh, and that would include the area around your, uh, your, your uh, gasket that's closing it off. You want to scrub that off, clean it up on a regular basis. But that's really the best way to keep it from getting built up is just to flush it out, flush it out with water. Uh, keep that stuff pushed out and off into your sink. Now, with that in mind, please have a good trap in your sink so that you can get rid of that. If you've got one of the old ones that was the old big brass traps that are awful and heavy and terrible, just move into the new world. Um, this isn't a digital product, but it's basically a, uh, a plastic five gallon bucket that goes under the sink, uh, acts as the trap. When you're ready, you just unplug the two tubes at the top, replace it with a new one, and then take that five gallon bucket out and throw it in the trash. Uh, it's just that easy. Um, and then that way you don't get quite as much as that of that nice odor that comes from uh, things that bacteria that collects uh, in that effluent that's coming off the machine. So anyway, I, I think that's the best way. Just keep it scrubbed up, keep it clean, uh, and it'll operate for a lot of years. All right. We have reached the end of our questions. Um, sadly, I guess, uh, there just aren't any more on the screen. So... So I just want to remind everyone that if, in fact, you are a CDT, uh, in a day or two, you're going to get uh, some instructions as to how to uh, get the credit for recertification. And how that is done, I will give you a little hint, is a test. And it's a very simple one. So uh, we, we just hope you get that into us quickly, and we'll get a certificate to you, which you then turn into the National Board for Certification of the NADL. And uh, at your one-hour credit, will be, uh, will be given to you. And then lastly, this is uh, recorded. This was recorded, so uh, you should be able to, to see this again and, and maybe take it to some of your other some of your peers in the, in the laboratory. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Brandon and Craig for doing a great job answering mm -hmm. your questions. I hope to be able to do this kind of thing again in the not too distant future. I think it's kind of nice where we're not scripted and where we have uh, really you guys control the direction of the of the meeting, uh, you, you attendees. So um, thank you again. Hope to see you at a, at a future webinar. We do have uh, webinars uh, every other week, every other Tuesday. So uh, look for the for upcoming ones, and we look forward to seeing you at them. Thanks very much for joining us. Bye-bye.